Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We are here. It is a beautiful, snowy, well, it snowed yesterday and it's going to snow today, afternoon. And we are going to talk about organizational change. And with me today, I have Robert Bogue, otherwise known as Rob. Rob, how are Hello. you, sir? I am very well. I am uh, super glad to have you here today. But before we get started in talking about change, why don't you tell everybody who you are and what you are all about. Well, first the earth cooled, then the dinosaurs came. No, <laughs> wait. Um, so uh, I run a company uh, called Thor Projects. We do, uh, hey, projects. Uh, my background, longtime technology, 14 years as an MVP and 25 books to my credit and blah, 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 right? But um, I, I really had this schizophrenia about deep technical and then a real passion for organizational change. Um, and that came out, uh, and I'm sure we're going to talk some more about that. But, but based in Indianapolis, uh, we have seven kids, two dogs. Um, I, there is no partridge, there is no pear tree. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, we just we just been doing this technology thing for a long time, and and I love it. And uh, if the you know the background's got in any indication, we, I love my toys. So yes, you are you have quite the the setup behind you, um, which we were just talking about <laughs> earlier. But we'll leave that for another. Uh another show. Uh, yeah. So let's talk about, uh, this, this notion of deep technical and organizational change. Uh, wh what do you, let's start with organizational change. Like what's your definition of that? Cause that's a, uh, that's a, that's a big bag. Yeah. So like the, the buzzword and I hate buzzwords. I'm like, I don't want to play buzzword bingo cause I'm, I'm never really good at it. Uh, the, the buzzword now is digital transformation, right? Like we want our organizations <laughs> yeah. to change. Like, okay, fine. Yeah, I hate right. that one. Uh, okay. So, so but, but here's the thing. Like for me, I think that every IT project, maybe save a couple, but every IT project is really an organizational change project in sheep's clothing. Okay. We, we do these things and whether it's a, oh, we're going to roll out Office 365 or SharePoint or we're going to. Uh, change the ERP system or we're going to do whatever we're going to do, right? Like all these things that we do in technology and we're like, oh, this is a technology. We're going to deploy the software. We're gonna... No, we're changing the organization. Yeah. Um, and so that's that for me, that's the, that's the thing, right? Is like, so we do all these projects that are really organizational change and how do we make the organization more effective? Sure. And we call them an IT project. Yeah. That's just crazy. Um, so, but, but let me, let me kind of back this up. Cause like you and I have history and you know this, yep. but, but not everybody does. So I started doing SharePoint in 2000. Um, so yes, I'm old. And then it really got popular in about 2005, 2006, seven. Well, so I'm trying to figure out, like I would do these beautiful technical implementations, beautiful, 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 the, the uptime and re reliability and recoverability and blah, blah, blah. Okay, great. And the organization still wouldn't change. They didn't communicate well with their employees. Nobody wanted to collaborate. Why would you collaborate? We don't want to collaborate. Yeah. Nope. I know my stuff. You know your stuff. We're not going to talk. Yeah. And I'm like, well, the reason for that is they just don't know how to do collaboration and communication. They don't know how to use the tool, the SharePoint tool. And so I wrote the SharePoint Shepherd's Guide for End Users. This is 2008. And I'm like, cool. I fixed the problem. You know, I'm like <laughs> patting myself on the back. Like, and then 2009 rolls around and I'm doing the same thing. I'm doing these beautiful implementations and the organizations aren't changing and I'm really depressed. And I, so I start reading organizational change literature. So this is 2009 and, and, and I'm reading Cotter and, and, uh, Kurt Levine, by the way, people say his name is Lewin. Actually look at the pronunciation. It's <laughs> Levine. Um, and, and I'm looking at all these guys and Cotter saying like 70% of org change projects fail. I'm like, Whoa. So it didn't, suddenly I'm like, okay, so now I get why my beautiful technology yeah. projects look great, smell great, and they stand up to, to storms, but the organization still isn't changing. Yeah. Uh, and so that's kind of how I ended up in this, in this organizational change bu bucket is I kept trying to help organizations learn how to communicate better, learn how to communicate be and uh, collaborate better, and they just weren't making that, that shift and that change. Where do you um, think where do you think the real problems come in? I mean, let's oh, let's. It's okay. Oh, it's people, right? It's people, right? Like it's all. It's not about 
like the bits are the bits and they flow yeah. and yeah, they're bugs. And like I wrote code and I've written plenty sure. of bugs myself, but, but it's all the people. It's honestly, it's a lot about our people, grown ups coming to work. And you're like, no, they, they're old. Yeah. No. I mean, are they grown ups? Yeah. Like, can they put their egos aside or at least keep them in check? Yeah. Can they understand how to do conflict? Can they, you know, how many times you and I have been doing this for a long time. So we, we go into a meeting and you have architect A and architect B or developer A and developer B, and they have a disagreement. Yep. And yep. and they're not Steve Ballmer. They didn't throw a chair off the stage or anything like that, but they're yelling at each other. And, yep. you know, you don't know. any Like, yep. guys, you should not do that. Yep. Um, and so that's the thing, right? Like, so that's the thing is I, I, I try to help people learn how to be better people. Um, and, and that's, that's kind of building competency, core competency. Um, and then, and then I use systems thinking, the ability to, to shape systems in ways that make it easier for people to do the right thing, uh, to make that, uh, friction a little less violent. Um, but do you think that people, organizations really want to change? I mean, you have to admit at, at, at some point you get to a certain size and you have a culture and your culture yep. has been dictated by either its management structure or the people that you've hired, which means yep. the management has obviously hired those people and maybe not yep. fired them. I mean, right. are we in a place where people, where organizations actually want to change or that is it just, Hey, that executive went to the same old executive summit and digital transformation is a big deal. So he feels like he's yep. got to put it on his damn resume and yep. And yep. yet same old shit, just different day. Yeah. So, so we have to recognize is uh, organizations are built. They are function built to not change. They're designed by their very nature to not change. And so when you say, I want to change the organization, you have got to be willing to fight city hall, swim upstream, yeah. because they, they don't. An organization doesn't. People may want to. Part of the organization may. But an organization as a whole likes the status quo because the status quo works. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think there isn't a desire to change be, until you get a market pressure that causes you to say, oh, I can't survive. Unless yeah. I change, uh, and then some people will decide that they want to make the change. But but by but isn't it too late then? I mean, when the market pressure's on, you know, depending on how good your your thumb is on the pulse, like now you're now you're on this defensive reactionary thing, and don't you just swing the pendulum the other way? Well, so so let me so let me pick let, let me pick a big a big huge thing. So we all know that self driving cars are coming. Yep. The, the well, maybe not. They may have stopped as of last week. <laughs> well, right. Yeah. I mean, kill a couple of people, whatever, yeah. run over a person. And, fine. But, details. but it's details. Yeah. Eventually, we are going to get to self-driving yeah. cars. When we get to self-driving cars, we're going to stop owning cars. Yeah. Because all of a sudden, all the cost matrix out of Uber at all goes away. Car shows up. You get to where you go. It's all on an app. Like, it's going to change construction. It's going to change all sorts of things. But so here's the thing. If you're in the business of selling cars today, you should be afraid about what the future brings for your industry. Not necessarily you personally, but you should sure. have that. Yep. Is it going to change tomorrow? No. Five years? Maybe. Ten years? Probably. Twenty years? You, hopefully you're retired or you're doing something else. Yeah. And, and so you can have those pressures that don't have to be right on top of you. Yeah. And, and, and you can still use them as motivators for change. Um, it really, again, I'm, I'm back to you have to be an adult at, at work. Yep. Yep. Uh, the, the CEOs who are willing to be vulnerable, who know they don't have it all figured out, who want to take that 10x improvement um, and, are willing, and, and are willing to just kind of do that by developing people, those are the people that really will get it and, yep. and will transform the organization basically by sheer willpower. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to not play like negative Nancy or negative Minnie on this, where you can say, "Well, you know, this guy's in his late fifties, whatever. He's got another five years. He doesn't care necessarily about the big industry if he can keep the keep the boat afloat while his his uh, ten years kind of playing out. Then things are cool." And and yet not really looking at the bigger picture of the the business can scale, the culture's toxic, like. 
You can yep. say, hey, let's go faster and, you know, work harder. But is that really the problem? Like, is that, hey. is it that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, we, we, when we're, when we're talking with people, um, we're very cognizant of the fact that, you know, just doing the same thing you've been doing and making it faster, automating it isn't enough, right? Like the state of Indiana, so I live in Indianapolis, the state of Indiana went bankrupt and now we have a very fiscally conservative policy, but why did we go bankrupt? Well, we went bankrupt because we bet on the canal system right as railroads were coming out <laughs> and the railroads kind of are a lot more efficient than a donkey pulling a boat down a canal. Yeah. yeah. And um, so it, it is these transformative events that happen that mean just doing the operational excellence and efficiency gathering isn't going to work. Yeah. When the when the business transforms, when the industry transforms, you have to transform with it. Yeah. So what if you're what if you're the guy or the girl who's on the floor grinding it out every day and you can see this and you can see that yep. the this like hey this this has got to change like this is wrong yep. Yep. what what can you do uh, you work on you <laughs> and that's not the answer everybody wants right like they're like hey well that other person if they do their thing then it's but really like how many times and, and I'm not saying you're ever going to get perfect at this. This is like the whole deal with mastery, right? Like it, mastery is not I never make a mistake. It's I make fewer mistakes. I figure them out faster. Sure. I recover quicker. But but how many times has every single one of us lost their cool in a meeting? How many times have we not been able to really listen? Oh, my gosh. Listen to the other person before calling them an idiot. Or, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. challenging their point of view, right? Like that – that is the thing. If, if I'm working with a change agent, so nobody not they're not at the top, they're in the middle, um, I am always talking about how do you change your attitude, how do you change your perspective, how do you get better skills to mediate when your boss and some other boss in the organization aren't able to work together? Sure. How do you lubricate that relationship to the point that it's functional, not dysfunctional? Um, and so it's not big sweeping things. But, but honestly, like people work in their own microcosms in the organization. Yeah. Right. So if you're you're in a small little part of the organization and your boss is good to you and you like your coworkers, you're going to stay. Yeah. Right. And and so all you have to do is fix you. And when you fix you, that'll radiate out like ripples. And the, the other people will go, hey, what's what's different about Bob? Yeah. Why 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 is why is Susie suddenly not ever angry? Um. And it, and it and it sort of builds, and, and you get this little bubble, which is your group, and it yeah. and even in a toxic organization, you can have a sphere of of safety. Sure, uh, that's actually pretty powerful and pretty cool. Sure. Pretty cool to see. Now, now you've been pulled into helping companies do some of this. Uh, what like what aha moment has the company had to like take that plunge? Are they already they already bought in? Like what? How do they? Why, why then? Yeah, yeah, it varies. Um, so sometimes I get involved because of the technology background. Sometimes I get involved. Uh, you have a new CIO, a new CTO, new new person from the outside sure. comes in, and he's got uh, IT pros, server guys, and devs that um, don't get along. And he's got other fish to fry. He's got other things he's got to work on. Um, and I'll get asked to come just take care of that thing. Um, if it's bigger and broader, they see things differently. So. We're sometimes brought in when the organization has a turnover problem. Um, so Bureau of Labor Statistics facts, um, just because these are fun, they're a little bit older, but uh, about 40% of people across all industries change every year. About half of that is oh, voluntary. Of all, of all industries. All, all up, right? Now, and there are, some, there are absolutely some that are higher and some that are sure, lower. Sure, sure. But, but That's an alarming 40, number. Four, four out of ten, and I'm rounding, four yeah. out of ten – the people that you start the year with will go away. Wow. Right. Now, if you think about if you if you really think about organizations uh, that you're in big organizations and you think about that number and you go, yeah, that's actually not that far. It might be 20 percent for sure. you. It might be 30. Yeah. And the other split with the, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics numbers is roughly half are voluntary. I left because I wanted to. The other half yeah. are. Thank you. Please pursue opportunities outside yeah, of the yeah. organization. Yeah. Um, so some organizations, uh, so let's pick on long-term health. 
like so we, we do lots of industries. One of them is long-term care, um, uh, nursing homes. Yeah. The CNA position, the position that touches the patients, is a six-week course. Their turnover rate is typically in the on the order of 80% per year. Wow. Eight zero per year. You have a wow. two in 10 chance of being able to see the same CNA in 366 days. Wow. That's crazy. That's a hell of an investment to just let go. Well, well, and, and, and so what happens is they spend all their money on the investment of replacing these folks. Cause right, totally. it, the CNA, CNA is actually not that hard to replace, but, but still you spend money retraining them and you spend yep. money acquiring them and recruiter fees and blah, blah. And, and you spend all your money on this. And then it, what people will say to me is, well, but it, that's because they're not paid well enough. No one could be paid well enough to do a great job taking care of our valued elders. No yeah. one could be paid. Enough. But the, the reality of hiring and firing, what the HR folks will tell you if you ask them quietly in a room and they, you promise not to record them is that people don't leave companies because of salary. Right. Once you get to a yeah. minimal level, once you're okay financially – like you can feed your family. People don't leave for money. They leave. Yeah. They leave because of a bad manager. Yeah. Sometimes yeah, I was gonna say. Just... I was gonna say. You, I bet if you gave them all the money, you'd still have that. Maybe it would be seventy percent. But right. Right. It's, there's, it's still there's... a culture problem. It's still the environment yep. around them. It's it's the it's a it's a people problem. Right. Right. And as much as I admire our elders and the folks that they they are working with, I recognize that they tend to be grumpy. <laughs> in pain and yeah. and really difficult to get along yeah. with right yeah. like it, and so you have to figure out a way to make that respect for them sure supersede get bigger than sure the difficulty sure. of dealing with them. that's right yeah you mentioned communication earlier and how how communication is a problem within organizations like yep in in the days of tools the the slacks and the skypes and the teams yep. and the whatever and the email goo we have like what about communications bad well so um it basically everything uh <laughs> but, but let, me give you, let me give you a specific example and everybody will be like yes yeah. okay so you're in a large organization okay you have a hundred people or more right hundred thousand hundred hundred thousand doesn't matter yeah every october november you get a message that says benefits re-enrollment is due by x date <laughs> <laughs> everybody yeah. gets yeah. this thing right yeah. and they get it and first of all you don't care about benefits re-enrollment right you yeah. don't care about benefits re-enrollment now if i teach the uh the hr folks and the communication folks if i teach them what i'm going to teach them is write a better subject line five things you must do to keep your benefits three things to keep the doctor bills down. Yeah. Right? That's what you as an employee care about. Yeah. Right? That's simple. There's some inverted pyramid stuff that's all basic, um, you know, 101 journalism class stuff that I will work with folks and give them that. So that just changes the, the message they're sending and makes yeah. it more appealing, puts it in a better wrapper for folks. But take the step back and go, there are different things that we want to know about an organization, and most organizations use a sledgehammer to shoot stuff at you, yeah. right? It's like yeah. the big whack-a-mole, the, yeah. the carnival, you smack it, and how yeah. high can I get it to go? Yeah. What, what they don't realize is there are different tools for different things. So in a larger organization, even a mid-sized organization now, you have digital signage. You have an intranet. You have a Slack. You have Microsoft Teams. You have whatever, yeah, right? A lot of noise. You have lots of channels, right? Now, and what's ending up happening is we've got to go check every one, which yeah. drives me batty. Yeah. But, but we're not targeting the message to the channel. So a good example on benefits re-enrollment. Um, I don't know about your home, but in my home, where my wife is a board-certified pediatric clinical nurse specialist, I don't make the healthcare decisions. <laughs> I, and and so sending me a That's message right. about benefit yeah. is useless. Yeah. So yeah. I don't believe in atoms. I believe in electrons. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, I believe atoms exist. Right. I just don't like them. 
Um, well, I like Adam. You like them. So just not enough to pay attention to them. Right. So, so, but this is a case where I actually would tell clients, print something. Yeah. Print something that's yeah. focused, targeted, useful, yeah. blah, blah, blah. But, but print something and put it in everybody's mailbox because they need to take it home to their spouse. Yeah. And, and if you want behavior, make it easy for them to do the behavior you want. Yeah. I was, I was going to say, do you think that we have stopped valuing our own people's time because there's an inherent hierarchy of like, I'm HR, so you must read this thing. And, and we don't really sit there and say, well, let me make this easiest for you because your job is super important. And this message, while important to me, is it universally as important to everybody? It's, it's, so I think it's really that we're not supporting and educating the folks who are doing the communication. Um, I, I do believe that they don't value taking other people's time, but I also don't think we enable them to be respectful of other people's time. So here's the thing. So an HR person does not have any idea how to do an outer join. Like what? Like right. they cannot do a SQL statement that has an outer join in it. They don't know how to do that. They don't know how to export – Excel won't even do this, right? Like you can't export out of the human capital management system and compare that to the existing all list and remove all the people that are in – that have signed up for beneficiary sure. enrollment and then yeah, just yeah, send the message totally. to them. Yeah. Like that's, that's like magical to them. Yeah. Like I talk to HR people and I'm like, I can do this for you. I can show you how to use it. But I'm going to have to give you access because it's the yep. only tool that you have available – and they're like, this is magical. And I'm like, no, it's 1990s. It's not, <laughs> like, yeah. this is not new technology. Yeah, that's right. But nobody's ever supported them and said, hey, you know what? Here's how you do it, and here's the five steps, and here's a little checklist. And, and now you can save the 300 people that did the right thing, the thing, and you can make the message stronger. So if I'm sending only to those right. people who of I course. know haven't done it, I can say – you're yeah. about to lose your benefits. Right. Tick tock, tick tock. You now have five days left. Right. Yeah. And you're not. I see you haven't even them. opened the email yet. Like what? Right. Is this right. person, does this person hear? Like what's maybe the person's right. sick, whatever. Right. Yeah, exactly. And um, so that's, it, it's, it's that we're not supporting them in the right ways. We're not educating them. Well, back, you know, big picture org change, right? How many people? IT people, HR people, business people have had one, so much as one course on organizational change. Yeah. I do yeah. this in rooms. I get one out of 100 people. One out of 100, and fundamentally, we have to change our organizations at least every year, if not every couple of months, yeah. and, and, and maybe not as big change, but no, we're not teaching anybody any of this. Yeah. How do we get in this problem? I mean, it, it seems like... I, I don't know. There seemed there, there was like a period of years where you just heard IT called the cost center and nobody wanted to. You, know, you were just stuck with these dilapidated piles of crap that ran the organization. And, you know, now we're in this advent of uh, lots of little micro tools have come out to solve these very kind of high, you know, vertical niche based things. Are, are we going to see this resurgence of like reinvesting in the organization to be a more efficient machine um I, I think that the employees are going to invest in ways to make themselves more efficient whether it likes it or not whether the organization likes it or not the consumerization of it has just done that to us sure or for us whatever uh but i actually think the thing that's going to cause us the biggest issue is we're moving to more freelancers, more gig economy. We work for the thing that project that we work on. Yeah. Our unemployment rates are low, very low, and they're, and they're staying low. And so employee attraction and retention is going to be a bigger and bigger and bigger uh, issue. Yeah, predicated and so, on what's your, yeah. what your place looks like. So what's – I mean I literally have folks I know now who spent a long time at their organization, great people – and before they move, every single organization they consider, they go out to the last door before they before yep. they so much as put an application in. Yep. Yep. And, and honestly, I'm like, that's super smart. But th that's what's happening now. Yeah. 
Yeah. And and the retention problem, you know what? If if you are a good developer or a good IT person, you can quit, you can find a job, you find a job, may not be the best job, or a gig or a whatever, really pretty quickly. It could be all remote. You don't have to go in, yeah. drive 30 minutes to – like. It, it, the economy and the way that we're we're at in the economy is, I think, going to force us into a different a different way of thinking about employees and and how do we retain them. Yeah, yeah. I it's interesting you brought that up. I uh, brought Glassdoor up too because we we now live n- not that we didn't before with IRC and whatnot, but we we certainly live in a place where uh, the word gets around and it gets around uh-huh. super fast. And yep. I've heard executives talk about how they're worried about, you know, their their credibility on the street. And it's like, if you're worried now, it's already too late. Yet, yet right. You already screwed up. Right. Uh, that that deal has been sent. It's in the Slack channels. It's in the yeah. it's in the the uh, the forums like. Yep. The community, the community is at large and is more connected than it's ever been. So, yeah, good. Good. You're not on Glassdoor. But that's not the only right. place too. Yeah, it's it's really kind of crazy. We one of the things that is one of my passions about organic change is uh, this thing, uh, Discover Truths, DiscoverTruths dot com, uh, and it's us sending an email out to employees every single week. It's a little five minute video, uh, and the idea is we're teaching them some of those core skills I mentioned. Like, what do you do to get better? Get better yourself. Yeah. Um, and we, we do that as a way of trying to help an organization demonstrate to its employees, we care about you as a person and your personal development um, and not, not, just, not just corporate. Because, you know, if I teach you active listening, and by the way, I can teach you active listening in five minutes. Um, I'm not going to do that here, but I can teach you active listening in five minutes. And I will tell you your relationship with your spouse will improve. And if it doesn't, you can send me an email and, and I can tell you either I didn't teach it right or you didn't learn it right or something. Because if you can go through it and learn how to be really good at active listening and it does not improve your primary relationship, then then something's wrong. Because even me, even every time I teach it, I, I, I can feel what happens in my relationship with my wife. Like it's like, wow, I really remembered to pay attention and, and have this active listening thing. Um, but people can take that with them and say, you know what, the, the employer isn't trying to get in my bedroom. They're not trying to be, but they're also at the same time trying to give me skills that make my life better. Yep. Yep. Yeah. It's, I mean, happy employee, happy boss, happy environment, happy products, happy customer. Yep. You know, I, yep. I feel like, uh, the days we are mature enough in our little infant industry because uh, let's be clear, our industry is super new relative to yep. the, the rest of the world. But yep. we are mature enough as human beings and where we are today with mindfulness and work-life balance that if you're standing up and you're trying to take time away from people's family, you're trying to run the grind and have shitty mm-hmm. tools and all that, you should really check yourself because there's just that that adage of crap is gone you don't get the most yep. product, productive work out of somebody you should be looking at quality like it, i think you could just go on and on and on and on yeah frederick taylor is dead yeah. he's the guy that was the stopwatch next like he's dead yeah so. um all right before my last question and 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 i'm going to spring it on you um i i acknowledge everybody uh who's been part of this uh and with that i i want to not just acknowledge you and send a bit of gratitude uh and thank you for being on this but more importantly we've crossed paths many a times over the past I don't know, 10 years or so now between morning. our little states and uh and and i know how much you've put into the community and the things around it and and thus i just want to thank you for being part of it and, and giving back because um you've done a, a whole heck of a lot of it so uh, thank you, sir, for everything. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Now, now, because you brought it up and because I think the pe- everybody would benefit from it, you're going to teach me active listening in five minutes. Oh, wow. Okay. So, Because I think – and mind you, everybody – there are people listening and watching. And so, you know, uh, you said you could do it in five minutes. So instead of just teaching me, we're going to teach everybody. Okay. Um 
give me just two seconds here because to get it in five minutes, I have to uh, I have to bring up one little cheat for me, um, and that will help me get this right and quick. All right, so here's the thing: when we listen to another person, when we listen to another person, we don't actually hear what they mean. We hear their words, and words are not their meaning. And so here's the trick. We've got to figure out how to hear what they mean and then challenge it. So active listening is really just about saying, this is what I think I heard using your own language and your own assumptions. So I teach this with Chris Argris's ladder of inference. So Chris Argris was a professor at Harvard, and he basically said that at the bottom you have a whole set of uh, reality and facts, then you select, then you interpret, then you make some assumptions and conclusions and beliefs and actions. Okay. So let me, let me run you through that real quick and then we'll okay. flip back to the active listening piece. So I go and I'm wandering through a park and I see a guy on a park bench and I'm thinking, man, this is awful. This guy is homeless. This is just awful. I have, I, I have assumed He's homeless because he's sleeping on a park bench, right? Sure. And then I draw some conclusions. Oh my gosh, this guy's just got to be down on his luck. Yep. And then I and then I start to then I start to build beliefs about the 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 folks around me and everything else. Like, oh my gosh, like like why can't somebody help this guy get up? And 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 then I finally I'm like, it's me. I've got to do something. And so I walk up to the guy and I hand him twenty bucks and he looks at me like I have three heads and I'm like, what? And he's like, what are you doing? And I'm like. Well, you're, you're clearly homeless, and, I, and so I'm going to give you the 20 bucks, and you can, you know, get a meal or whatever, whatever right? Like, it's not everything, yeah. but, but, you know. And he says, what? Huh? He says, why, how, why do you think I'm homeless? He says, look, I'm a troop leader for a bunch of Boy Scouts, and we had a camp out in the park this evening, and my tent happened to be in a puddle. So I decided I was going to get up and sleep on a park bench rather than being in a puddle. You know, and he says that, and I take a step back, and I look around, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, there's all these little pup tents, right? Yep. And, and, and so you think about that, and I made these set of assumptions based on the, only the data I selected, and it sent me in this totally radically wrong different place. So the trick is you use Argus's ladder to check the next layer. So if you were to say, boy, Rob, you know, I'm really, I'm, I'm really sad today because my dog died, I'm not going to go, man, that really sucks your dog died. Because that's the obvious answer. Sure. Right? That's the, I'm a parrot, and I've repeated it back to you. Yep. The active listening answer, the really cool active listening answer is, Clark, man, wow. I, boy, I had a dog, and, and I feel your emptiness. I feel like that, that, like you just miss having your dog there every day. And what did I do? What I did is I jumped up a level, right? Yep. I went to meaning. Like, Clark's telling me his dog died. That's literal fact. Okay, great. But, but, but what does that mean to him? I'm asking that question. And you know what? You, you can actually return that back to me and go, you know what? Nope. Nope. I, I'm actually glad the dog is dead. That dog <laughs> ate so many of my conference t-shirts and the furniture, and I am so glad he's gone. But the thing is, like, you're not upset with me for making that assumption and really trying to clarify it. You're like, Rob's really trying to get to know me. He's yeah. like really trying to get into my space. Yeah. Um, and so if you do that, if you learn how to do that, um, then you end up with better active listening skills. What did they say? What do they mean? Yeah. What did they say? What do they believe? Right. Um, and if you start to make those jumps, then you're doing really cool active listening. So um, I think I did that in about four minutes. Yeah. That's <laughs> impressive. It's impressive. So, and so I encourage everybody who's been listening to go back and actively listen to that another time. Hit, hit rewind five minutes and and uh, participate. But it's fantastic. Uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes another glorious edition of Ask That. Uh, I'm curious on your thoughts of organizational change. Is it a fallacy? Can it happen? Um, do you think it can happen? Have you seen it happen? Uh, leave some comments in our comment window wherever you're at and uh, give us a thumbs up if you like it. Rob, where can they find you? Uh, so the primary site to find me is thorprojects.com slash blog. We'll give you my blog. 
and I'm reading and reviewing a book every single week, mostly psychology, neurology, all this stuff, trying to figure out how to make work change work. Uh, they can also look at discoveredtruths.com if they want to see that. Uh, and finally, one thing is just kind of for fun. If they go to kin, K-I-N, the number two, kid, K-I-D, uh, dot com, they will find a set of child safety cards that my wife and I put together, which is one of our – that's one of those not related to technology sure, or this topic. Totally. But it's one of the cool things that, that we do to try and help keep kids safe. So we really enjoy it. Right. And we will put a link to all of those things down in the uh, notes below. And with that, Rob, thank you for being on. And uh, can't wait to cross paths soon. Awesome. Thank you, Clark. Thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll see you next time.